Hi, it's Tom here from Running Physio. I wanted to come and talk to you today uh, about some really interesting new research that has got really interesting findings in terms of a patient's experience of living with pain. Um, and I think it's really important that we recognize this lived experience. And there are actually a number of unmet needs that patients have. And if we recognize these needs, we can work better uh, to help actually cater for them with our patients. So we're gonna talk mainly about four research papers and you'll see each of these four papers has these common themes. Each of them did interviews with patients with various different conditions and took out these common experiences and concerns that they had. So let's start by talking about one of the first things that came out, which is the big life impact that any injury can have. And that was highlighted really nicely by Sean McAuliffe's work back in 2017. Now this slide's taken from our Achilles tendinopathy webinar series, and there's a link to access that uh, in the title of this. Now what Sean McAuliffe's work found is that Achilles tendinopathy had a really significant impact on people's lives and their everyday activities, and activities they really value, like sport and running. And that there was a lot of fear and uncertainty, particularly regarding fear of damage uh, with Achilles tendinopathy. And we see this with patients a lot in clinic, that they're very concerned about causing lasting harm to their tissues. Interesting from Sean McAuliffe's work is they found that this might actually affect adherence to exercises. And we know that adherence is very variable. So if people do have this fear and uncertainty, we need to address it very early on to help them get on board with these exercises. This research also highlighted concerns about the future and a lot of confusion regarding treatment and also the benefits of rest versus running. And these are all things that we can potentially address uh, if we take the time to discuss it with the patient. More recently in 2020, we've had this uh, really interesting study in plantar heel pain, again, asking patients about their experience with it. And I've picked out a couple of quotes because I thought they were really telling. Again, along the line of, of the impact that these conditions have, one of the uh, patients in this study said, I don't feel as strong in my whole body. I'm a mouse in a wheel. I can't seem to get off. I don't know what to do. Now, this is someone with plantar heel pain that's feeling the effect in their whole body, and they really don't know how to manage it. And a lot of these subjects have actually already been through treatment processes, but they've come out the other side no clearer about how they can manage the condition. And I think that's a key point I'd like people to take away is to make sure that we actually equip people with the skills and knowledge to manage. Because when we talk about education, education can mean a lot of different things. And it might be what we perceive as being useful, but that doesn't necessarily mean the patient perceives it as being useful or that it necessarily addresses their needs. And there's another quote from uh, Cochester Tool's work in plantar heel pain that highlights this. So a subject says, a lot of education is do this or do that, but without really explaining what it is you're doing and why you're doing it and what you're supposed to achieve. And when I read this, it really struck a chord with me because I, I think that there's a process sometimes that happens when we work with patients. They come in, we assess them, we form some kind of working diagnosis, we give them stuff to do and away they go. But does that actually deal with their needs? Does it actually help them to understand why they're choosing to do things, what the benefits of those things are? And I think a really key area for this is with our exercise prescription. Think about it from a human point of view. If someone just hands you a sheet of exercises and sends you away, you're not gonna do them. You need to know why. You need to feel that it's gonna benefit you and that it actually links to your goals as an individual. So I think it's really worth when we're giving exercises or any treatment suggestion, we take the time out to explain this is how I'm, I think it's gonna help you. This is why I'm suggesting that you're gonna do it. This is how it links with this goal that's important to you. So really take the time uh, to take that education to another level to really help the patients. Now, another study uh, recently uh, in Achilles tendinopathy, um, and I've linked to, to all of these uh, in the title below, by the way, um, is Turner et al's work. And there's this great little quote, just a little gem to take from it that says, educate beyond using words. And I love that phrase because I think it highlights that education isn't just about telling 
it's also about listing, but it can be about using images, about using videos, about using patient stories, and, and actually working with the patient to find out what works for them. Some people are really visual, they want an image. Um, others actually would like something to go away and read. And more and more people now want to know about things like research. In Cochita Tool paper, one of the subjects commented that they wanted an evidence-based approach. So these patients may be interested to go off and read the studies. They may even be interested in these studies we're talking about here because it can show them that other people are experiencing similar things. So we can think about the idea of education beyond words and something I use a lot with patients is images like this because I think it's easier to explain things. So this is an image I would use with a patient who maybe they're experiencing um, that their, their pain hasn't really uh, improved yet. And so they're saying to me, I, I just don't think I'm really getting any better. My pain's really not changing. But actually when you talk to them, you find out that they're doing much more than they were. And so we quite often have this picture that you can see on the screen that activity is gradually increasing over time, but pain isn't changing. But that's still very much a win because you're bringing valued activities back in their life. And what you often find is the pain gradually starts to subside a little bit further down the line. So we can use an image like this to show people the progress that they've made. But also, we want to be a little bit careful that we don't dismiss that pain hasn't changed. Acknowledge that that's clearly important to them and that we're going to help them work on it, but help them to see you're doing much more than you were, you're heading in the right direction. So another study uh, that's looked at this, again, another recent study, and you'll see these, these themes overlapping again. Uh, Stevens et al. looked uh, at the life impact of greater trochanteric pain syndrome or lateral hip pain. And again, we have a webinar series uh, all about this that you can access through our running resource page uh, with a link again in the description. Now, they, they include this graphic which has got some brilliant overarching themes. So in the top box on the right-hand side here, the impact of living with this condition. Now patients with this have pain that affects their ability to be active and do daily uh, tasks of daily living, but they also have a double whammy because they often have pain at rest in sitting, lying, and sleeping. So it's very difficult for them to escape from. They can't be active, but they also can't rest. It's very hard to manage. And I think we could really empathize with the impact that that's gonna have on someone's life and how that could really easily affect huge aspects of your life. They often, with this condition, will have coexisting problems too. Things like uh, back pain and other hip pathologies, very common in lateral hip pain. Um, obesity can be a factor too, which is associated with severity. They can be pessimistic about future recovery, which sometimes we can perhaps almost blame the patient for that, which I think is unfair, when it might be actually that they're having a real challenging time, a really difficult time managing it, so it's understandable they might be pessimistic about things getting better in the future. In the, the box beneath it, about, this talks about confusion around diagnosis, pain and activity. And there's a lot of confusion around diagnostic labels. And I think sometimes when we, we tell someone what something is, we place a diagnostic label on it, that is literally all we're doing. We're slapping a label on it it doesn't actually necessarily help their understanding to have a great big long medical sounding label that really doesn't tell them much more about it and perhaps actually even leads to more worry in some cases. So we wanna go beyond just sticking a label on it, explain the condition so they can understand it. I think sometimes we forget too that a lot of patients have previous experience of treatments, particularly ineffective treatments. We're not their first rodeo, if you know what I mean. We think they come to us fresh, but actually they've often been through these things before, and we need to explore that in those early sessions to see what they've tried, see what's helped them, and also what hasn't. Now, this is something that I've, I've found this next point, feelings of being dismissed by clinicians. This I find really frustrating, but it's also mentioned in the Cochita Tool paper that patients regularly feel dismissed by clinicians, and this is something that I think we all need to be aware of. If you're managing a really busy caseload, if you've got very, very little time with patients, if your kind of compassion and care levels are running a little bit low because you're rushed off your feet, it is sometimes easy to slip into being dismissive, but I think we really wanna make a lot of effort to make sure that doesn't happen. And there's a quote here from Stevens et al, which I think really highlights the impact that that can have. So the subject in this study said, I was disgusted with the consultation, 
because my whole life and social life is stopped because of the bursitis. And he just said, take the painkillers. So this is a person that's being dismissed, not really being offered any uh, education around the problem, any other options. And this patient says in their interview, they don't want to take medication for it. I think this quote in uh, a nutshell sums up a lot of what's going on um, in this particular sort of lived experience of things because we have the patient having a, a big impact on their life. Their whole life and social life is, is stopped in their words. We have altered beliefs around pain. They think it's because of bursitis, which we know from more recent research often isn't the case with lateral hip pain. Um, and then we have someone who, instead of dealing with the, that life impact, is dismissing them and just saying, take the painkillers. We can do better than this, I think. And I think that's why this is so important, because we have to recognize this life impact in order to improve the standard of care that we can give to patients and lessen this impact. So in uh, these different studies, we see these similar themes and we see them again here in Turner et al's work in Achilles tendinopathy. Again, a recent study. Now, they, they found these four overarching themes that they've highlighted really nicely in this image. So biopsychosocial impact, future prognosis and outlook, experience with management, and beliefs and perceptions. And I just want to highlight to you two quotes from this wheel. Bottom right-hand corner, I no longer feel like I'm in control of it now. This is so important because this is a patient who's probably had treatment but still doesn't feel they're in control of their condition. So we need to give people back that control and we need to try and make sure that our treatment is designed to do that and isn't just a question of sending people away with a list of stuff to do. And then in the top left around beliefs and perceptions, I'm just scared that I might rupture a tendon. Now, this is so important. Working with a lot of patients with Achilles pain and with tendinopathy in general, this concern, this fear about damage comes up again and again and again. And if we don't address it, I think that is leaving patients with another unmet need. Um, if you want to be able to, to run, if you want to be able to do sports and you're terrified of rupturing a tendon, that's going to really stop you. We know from other research that positive perception is really important for return to sport. And we can't have that if we're fearful that sport is going to cause us severe damage. So I think we need to try and identify those beliefs and concerns um, around damage in, in generally in conditions, but particularly in tendinopathy and address them early on. So in this last uh, graphic I've got for you is to sum up some of the common themes then that we're seeing from this, this research in plantar heel pain and Achilles tendinopathy and in, in uh, lateral hip pain and some solutions that hopefully we can offer. So the common themes that come out, patients are confused about their condition, uh, what it is and how they can manage it. They show concerns about the prognosis and the future and they often encounter dismissive clinicians. So they have unmet needs, but they have a desire for more information and better understanding. And for me, that can only be a good thing. You know, this is what we're really good at. If we can take time out to actually help them have this information and better understanding, then I think that's really going to help. They, these uh, conditions have a negative impact on life as a whole, um, on social life, on work and on valued activities. And there's often fear of damage as a big part of this picture. So the solutions then, well, take the time to explain the condition and how the patient can manage it. Make it as specific to them as you can and then check their understandings of the key messages. Ask them, you know, what have you taken from today? Um, what, you know, how will this help you going forward? Discuss prognosis and expectations um, and help them to see that things can get better. And it can be helpful to give examples of similar cases that have done well. Uh, I, was work, I was working with a patient with plantar heel pain recently who's had a really tough time with it um, and who's had a small uh, plantar uh, rupture and I was able to talk to her about two patients that have done very well, one that got back to multi-day multi ultramarathons and one that actually managed to get to European gold in her age group uh, from a very similar position. So you can show people there is light at the end of this tunnel. You may feel at the moment, because you've had such a hard time, that this is just going to get worse, but it can actually get quite a lot better. Rather than dismissing people and their concerns, listen, engage, and empathize with them as much as possible. Um, but be aware that reassurance can sometimes be heard as being dismissive. So think about it. Imagine you've got a really severe pain. You've really struggled with it for months, 
and your first encounter with a clinician is for them to tell you, right, it's nothing serious, it's nothing to worry about. Now, we may feel we're being reassuring there, but actually the patient may feel we've not really understood the size of the problem for them and that we're dismissing it. So that is something to bear in mind. Balance reassurance with empathy and show people that you understand the situation they're in. Provide them some validation for that experience. Ask your patients what their needs and goals are and if they're being met and invite questions rather than avoiding them. Another comment in these studies that were uh, that clinicians were quite often uh, trying to avoid questions, they, they were dismissive of them. But actually, I, I want people to ask me questions. I want people to come to see me and feel they can share their concerns. So I'll say to them, by all means, write a list of questions to come along next time. Grill me if you want to. I won't know the answer to everything, but I'm going to do my best to help you understand this. And find out what type of information the patient prefers and tailor it to them. You can have a simple conversation. What do you think is going to help you understand this? Would you like some written information? Would, would uh, some pictures or videos be useful for you? What bits are you not quite understanding at the minute? And then guide them back to value, valued activities, including their sport, and explain how this can help. This is another theme that comes up again and again through these really good research papers, is that people want to get back to activities, but they don't know how. They don't know whether it's going to be damaging for them. And in many cases, they're not given any framework to work in. So I think it's an opportunity to talk to them in, uh, about what pain is expected, so we can lessen fear of that pain but that that pain is acceptable and give them some idea around what may well be a manageable level of pain to work with. Help them uh, to gain control and understanding of that. And then the final point we've got on our list here is ask about their beliefs around the injury and what's happening in the painful area. That's gotta be our starting point. Ask them what they feel is going on beyond the label that's been put on their pain. And then once we've got those beliefs, we can start to discuss them and work with them and try and build a picture of a strong, robust tissue that actually is going to respond very positively to movement activity, providing it's at the right level. So a uh, whistle-stop tour then um, of this recent research in uh, the lived experience of pain. And hopefully you can see why it's important um, that we recognize these unmet patient needs, that we try and go a little bit further to help them really to understand their condition. And I'm gonna leave you with a bit of food, food for thought here. Uh, I wonder sometimes that the pressures we're under as clinicians to do certain things within a session, um, to, that, to go through a specific kind of structure with our, particularly with our initial assessment, we have all these things we're under pressure to cover. I do wonder if those things have been set up uh, in a way that actually caters for patients' needs. Are we sometimes pressured to follow our agenda, to tick off the list of things we need to do, and in doing so, we're denied the time to actually address the patient's agenda? and give them the opportunity to share their concerns and provide a session that's valuable for them. So I think we need to be perhaps flexible around our sessions. If it means sometimes you only get the subjective done in your first session with the patient, I think that's fine because that might be much more valuable to delve into things for that patient to really share their story and raise their concerns than it would be to try and shut them down when they're telling you stuff that's important to them in order to squeeze things in so you can feel you tick off that box of completing an objective. So something to think about, maybe, but we need to be a bit more flexible around our assessment uh, and our treatment of patients to really focus on meeting their needs. Okay, I look forward to reading your questions and things in the comments afterwards. As I've mentioned, uh, we put a link in the title there uh, to our running resources page where we've got free webinars on Achilles tendinopathy, lateral hip pain, and lower back pain in uh, athletes. So do check those out. If you've got any questions, pop them in the comments. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon.